Yeah, let me know when we can start. Meanwhile, I can see my uh, good friend David has joined in from the USA. Uh, hi, David. <laughs> hi, David. What time is it there? It is 11 a.m. Oh, that's okay. The timing is perfect. Excuse yeah. my, my visual of my house. <laughs> not at all, not at all. So nice to see you. I'm so happy that you are here. The pleasure is entirely mine. Thank you for the honor of inviting me. Yep, my pleasure. So very frankly, uh, let me know that uh, when you are done with the sharing, that I can proceed. Yeah, I'm on my way. Uh, just give me some time. I'm on it. Yeah, okay, okay. Other alternative is we can start and then you can share it later on. Yeah, that would be fine. Sir. I think, I think uh, people are waiting. Yeah, exactly. people are waiting. Okay. okay, okay. Uh, right, sir, let me just introduce you. Uh, yeah. Yes. So we have Dr. Dash with us uh, and he's an MBBS. Uh, MD Anesthesiology, Senior Consultant in Anesthesiology, uh, Kol uh, Apollo Multispeciality Hospital, Kolkata. So you may proceed with your webinar. Okay. Thank you very much for your introduction, Dipanita. Um, good evening here in India uh, and welcome to all of you to this uh, webinar on 7th April, which is known as the World Health Day. As uh, uh, as you know, every year, the World Health Organization uh, so kind of uh, commemorates uh, 7th April as the World Health Day. And like every year, uh, they have a, a theme. And this year's theme is uh, Our Planet, Our Health. Uh, I'm not, obviously this focuses on um, uh, climate uh, change that has occurred and you must have all heard that unless we reduce the greenhouse emissions by 2025 or a little later than that it is going to be too late to change it and what what is happening and that could mean uh, disastrous effects on our planet and obviously uh, climate change also affects uh, our health and hence this uh, warning by world health organization uh, commemorating the theme as um, our planet, our health. But I'm going to uh, uh, give my take on it and take it to your, uh, you know, we all don't realize uh, uh, that the plan, there is climate change going on. Some of us even deny it. And, uh, you know, it's something like which is far away. Uh, but uh, if I talk of something personal, something which is really going to affect your health, what is happening to your health, to our health nowadays. And that may uh, strike a chord. So I'm going to, uh, you know, share a couple of slides. Uh, just bear with me for a second. One moment. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Yeah, you're able to see. Okay. Okay, great. So this is the uh, theme and the logo of this year's uh, World Health Day, uh, our planet, our health. But uh, as I said, my personal um, take would be a little bit uh, different. That uh, I, uh, there is a 
very uh, 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 not famous but a saying which i like very much uh, which is that uh, uh, by a ukrainian uh, geneticist settled in the united states now that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution so in our planet we have uh, our planet is 4.5 billion years old and many kind of creatures have lived in this planet have come have become extinct for example the dinosaurs they survived here for 165 million years that's a huge huge long time and after that they got extinct we all know why and after that uh, many other uh, species came and then then that was the time of the the world of the apes as it is known and after, from the world of the apes uh, from the apes we have uh, descended and if, if i uh, give you a picture of the uh, apes how we have evolved it looks something like this about roughly 5 million years ago uh this is known as the australopithecus we, uh, and we were kind of quadrupeds and we used to live in trees the apes used to live in trees and they used to eat fruits and um, and the leaves and the other uh, things which were there but uh, thanks to climate change once again the ice ages which melted away the um uh, the took away the grasslands and the trees we the apes were forced to come down and forage and look for food and that is when they became bipeds uh, they were forced to become bipeds and then slowly the homo species started to evolve the homo uh, habilis and the homo erectus and then the homo erectus survived for 3 million years and then the homo sapiens and uh, everything was fine you know what i am trying to tell you is none of these uh, uh, creatures they were they were kind of insignificant creatures in the words of the famous historian yuval noah harari and they did not have the ability to change their environment till about 75000 years back when something happened which is known as the cognitive revolution that enabled uh, the human beings to the homo sapiens to uh, think start thinking and recognizing things and analyzing power of analyzing and, and uh, very interestingly enough that coincided with the hunter gathering a hunter gatherer habit of theirs when they started uh, you know kind of hunting and eating animals and eating the eating of the fat and the meat and other things also coincided with the increase in brain size and that is when they started thinking i'm not very sure that that is a very good thing that happened considering the fact that we have brought the planet to the brink of extinction but uh, the fact is it happened we became intelligent creatures and uh, we continue to evolve till i would say you know but genetically kind of the last change was that we were able to chase animals after that nothing much has changed in our intelligence and in fact just before the discovery of agriculture this uh, species was which were known as cromagnons they were perhaps the healthiest and the most intelligent with a brain size of 1700 grams and with a body of nearly 6 and a half feet or 7 feet uh, today as you know uh, 12000 years after agriculture our brain size has shrunk to 1500 grams and no longer are we that tall and that fit the only thing they were uh, a problem for them where they would survive the the hardships of nature as they grew up but once they grew up they were much more you know healthy and sturdier than what we are today with the right side of the picture which you are seeing all these things happened after the discovery of agriculture even much after that i would say because for hundreds of years we were quite okay until we started you know ma- manipulating our food you know the production the development of the modern flour which occurred 200 years ago then the industrial agriculture came in you know the mechanization of food the processing of food and even the gmo foods which have come in now so all these things have had an effect on the health of the modern day human beings in fact i would say we have never been so sick before so what has happened is 
uh, we are sick. Despite of all the recent advances in medicine, despite of all the high tech uh, medicine and the and the procedures that we do, what we follow, we are all struggling with diseases which were once upon a time very rare. Once upon a time, diabetes was hardly ever heard of. Once upon a time, uh, cancer was rare. Now it has become a household word. And these are the non-communicable diseases has, has spread so much that it is simply growing out of proportion. Once upon a time, World Health Organization uh, thought that, you know, they, that they would achieve health for all of 2080 or 2020, but it has never happened. Things, the these non-communicable diseases have just become the number one killer. And so in that context is my topic today. I am going to... Uh, you know, address the fact that are you as healthy as can be in the, under these circumstances? So, if you look at the data uh, from in uh, Center of Science and uh, Environment, this is uh, data from Government of India. They, the very first thing they tell you is that today lifestyle diseases are the number one killer, and in our country is kind in kind of a transitional state. Uh, we have over sixty one percent of the deaths. Are in the country, which are attributable to lifestyle or non-communicable diseases. Every 12th Indian is a diabetic. Every 7th Indian is the pre-diabetic. And the overfat prevalence in India, in Indian adults, is more than 80%. If you want to know what overfat is, I have uh, mentioned in my previous seminars, that a fat person is something, a person who will be visibly obese, you can make out. But what is more harmful is uh, lean and thin people with a uh, fat in the uh, belly, which is known as uh, internally or visceral fat. So uh, a lean person with a pot belly is much more uh, unhealthy than even a person who looks fat. So if you uh, uh, add up the fat person uh, and the over fat people, these uh, lean people, so it becomes more than 80% of the population. We have, you know, 1.3 million new cancer cases every year and 2.7 million people uh, indians die of heart and heart disease every year and you if you have had a look at the newspapers every other day young indians are just dropping dead of heart attacks and they seem to be so healthy so all these things are happening very in a, at a very rapid state. so these lifestyle diseases have become a number one killer. So we need to understand why this has happened. So I will try and give you, a, you know, some data and some understanding. So if you look at this paper, which was uh, published, uh, this is an American publication, but uh, uh, if you look at what defines metabolic health, waist circumference, glucose levels, your blood pressure, HDL, cholesterol, and triglycerides, it was found that only 12% of the population is metabolically healthy. I'm sure if a similar study is done in our country, if it will be, the data will be even worse than this or same or even worse. So less than 10% of the people, I would say, is metabolically healthy. So this is a shocking realization. And, you know, for the, the tragic fact is that for the first time in the history of our species, we have a generation today whose lifespan will be lesser than the previous generation. You know, throughout our evolution, our health has gone in such a way that our lifespan has gradually, you know, improved. But now, thanks to these metabolic diseases, uh, the lifespan will be uh, lesser than the previous generation. That is what is predicted. Uh, so the common belief, or if I ask you, that what is the cause of major uh, major cause of these lifestyle diseases, whether it is uh, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol, or is it a poor diet? So most people believe that uh, it is because we, you know, we eat more, we drink, and we don't exercise. That is why we keep becoming obese and diabetic. But the fact is, this is a Lancet publication. It is a poor diet which contributes maximum to these metabolic disorders. It is together more than tobacco, alcohol, and physical inactivity. So that is what is 
globally a poor diet is responsible for more diseases and death than the lack of physical activity smoking and alcohol combined so but why i am telling you is that even after knowing or rather um, realizing the fact that a, a diet is the most important cause of metabolic disorder very funnily enough or sadly enough i would say nutrition is not a subject in our curriculum in our entire medical career uh, we have hardly had any classes other than you know maybe a class or so on vitamins on nutrition as a subject on nutrition as a cause and as a therapeutic approach and that is so all over the world this is uh, american data of national academy of sciences and over there also hardly any classes on nutrition that is a kind of mainstream medicine norm and hence what has happened is nutritional science is in a mess and it is there's a lot of misconceptions which has come up so basically what i would say is that our bodies are still very old millions of years old genetically if you look at it it look at it from an evolutionary perspective so and we have so so we have a stone age body and we are giving it processed food that space age food so it just just doesn't match so that is one explanation why our health has deteriorated and it also it has led to a lot of misconception misconceptions in you know in you know which we get to hear every day like like we need to eat six times per day small small meals you know all calories are the same to lose weight you must eat less and exercise more you must have heard it so many times eggs and meat will kill you saturated fat will clog your arteries grains are heart healthy uh, breakfast is the most important meal of the day fasting is nothing but starvation ketogenic diets will kill you but let me tell you that all of this are misconceptions small small eating small small meals per day is nothing but a you know a, a assault on your body all calories are the same are claimed only by you know the the, the companies or the cola companies which sell um, you know, very high processed food to eat less and exercise more is the biggest lie we have told people for losing weight biggest lie we have told for 50 years all the eat less studies and exercise more studies have proved it otherwise uh, i'm not going into the details that will take a long time but you must watch our previous webinar of mine on why we gain weight now uh, eggs and meat and will kill you how can they they have we have been eating eggs and meat for millions of years something that is out of nature can never can never be harmful and saturated fat will clog your arteries we have been saying and <clears throat> that is just not true uh, even the american heart association or the ada has uh, uh, has taken back uh, their statement on saturated fat and cholesterol and they have said that dietary cholesterol is uh, no longer a nutrient of concern of course that has not translated into practice but the, it is a fact grains are not heart healthy grains are you know just you know, they are very complex carbohydrates and they break down into sugar breakfast was never a norm until 200 or 300 years back and <clears throat> so breakfast is also once again a marketed concept once upon a time it was not pure we all had to go out hunt and get our own food that would be the first meal of the day fasting uh, has existed for millenniums people have fasted for religious reasons and um, because of natural reasons they would not get food for a long period of time during our evolution which i showed you there would be prolonged times where people would not get food and our bodies are much better adapted to not eating than it is adapted to eat multiple times throughout the day that is why we fall sick and if you do not eat do not if you fast then your body you know kind of adapts itself and you know liberates more energy more growth hormone more noradrenaline if you want to know the technical terms 
and ketogenic diet this is very sad because we doctors we learned the word ketogenic you know in diabetic ketoacidosis which is a very rare condition that to only in type 1 diabetics and the moment they hear the word ketogenic diet they think that you know, this is very very harmful but let me tell you ketones are just like glucose ketones are fuel for the body and much better fuels they are not only fuel they are longevity molecules once again you have to watch my previous webinar on that but it's a fascinating science and the and it is very scientific to say that a ketogenic diet is a diet which our bodies are naturally suited to so let's let's try and quickly understand what we eat when we eat we eat um, uh, fat we eat protein and we eat carbohydrates these are known as macronutrients and macro micronutrients are vitamins and minerals i will not go into the micros micronutrients because i believe that if you um, take care of your macros your micros will take care of itself so out of these uh, macronutrients protein is i would say very essential a uh, very much needed because you need proteins for your muscles and proteins uh, are built from amino acids so you must have heard of the term essential amino acids why essential essential means that uh, your bodies cannot manufacture and you have to eat it from outside take it from an extraneous source so there are essential amino acids there are also essential fatty acids which we cannot manufacture is needed by our body but would you believe it that there are no essential carbohydrates now if i every time i say that there are people who say that oh your brain needs glucose you know red blood cells need glu glucose some other cells need glucose yes they do but how much to maintain a blood sugar for around 100 i would say for 24 hours all you need is around 4.5 to 5 grams which is a teaspoonful and that teaspoonful of glucose can be manufactured in your own body by the liver so actually you do not need to eat carbohydrates or sugar from an extraneous source and this is mentioned in our literature but we seem to have forgotten this is from iom is institute of medicine so the father of all guidelines and they have very clearly mentioned that uh, the lower limit of uh, dietary carbohydrate compatible with life is zero absolutely zero and the low, and provided adequate amounts of protein and fat is consumed and they have also studied traditional populations which just do not eat carbohydrate and they have survived very well so this is one thing that uh, um, we have to keep in mind that we are eating a non essential nutrient and unfortunately it comprises a major portion of our daily diet so what happens let's have a look at this picture so a carbohydrate is over here green and the red dot and the dotted line is the insulin levels so when we eat carbohydrate especially the processed carbohydrates you know like uh, uh, when we get up in the morning we our breakfast we have sandwiches we have uh, cereals and uh, we have in india we have uh, chapatis puris and you know uh, upma all these things they are highly um, you know, rich in carbohydrates and the sugar level and the insulin level they just shoot up sorry go back yeah so they just shoot up and the effect of protein is not that much and the effect of fat is very very little on the on the sugar uh, glucose and the insulin level so what happens is that uh, suppose i'm assuming you are a normal person you have a glucose spike as soon as you have breakfast which is primarily carbohydrates uh, most of the time um, and what happens that liberates a lot of insulin from the pancreas your insulin level shoots up and insulin mind you is a storage hormone it stores your fat it blocks your fat breakdown it it kind of prevents fat burning and after some time the insulin brings down your sugar level and the glucose level crashes so if you have had breakfast 
at uh, 8 am again at by 10 10 30 you feel very hungry and either in your at your office at your home and food is you know available everywhere snacks especially and you, you have start eating again so the pattern so a pattern sets in what happens is you have breakfast and after some time you feel hungry you have a snack and then you have lunch again the again the insulin level shoots up again you have a snack supper and dinner and so so throughout the day your your insulin poor your pancreas poor fellow doesn't have the time to settle down this was never meant to happen evolutionarily pancreas you know would secrete very little insulin needed once in a while so now what is happening insulin i have nothing against insulin mind you it is a master hormone needed by every cell in the body but what is dangerous is chronic hyperinsulinemia so that is what is happening throughout the day when you keep on eating small small meals and this is what leads to insulin resistance anything present in excess of itself like you know it's like antibiotic resistance you have too much you to worry about hello uh, so what happens is that Uh, you develop insulin resistance because of hyperinsulinemia so this becomes a problem and this and as i told you insulin stores fat there is excess body fat and it is also a state of inflammation mind you so all these things contribute to metabolic disorders as you can see the all the metabolic disorders which i was talking about yeah cardiac heart disease arthritis cancer so this is what happens when uh, there is excess of insulin in your body hyperinsulinemia and this it's not that it will happen to everybody at one given time there is something known as a carbohydrate tolerant limit that varies from person to person so uh, one particular person may tolerate some amount of carbohydrates but another person cannot the problem is this tolerance is going down you know rapidly due to the changing environment so you will say that if you ask me that yes our grandfathers and their ancestors they were much more tolerant they were eating uh, you know a lot of carbohydrates in our country especially we are a rice eating country and uh, they kind of uh, uh, could nothing happened to them not much it was a rare thing but now today the rice we eat have has changed the wheat we eat has changed it has become genetically modified it has bec- the glycemic index of these foods have gone up like anything and combined with the you know other factors it has led to a lower tolerance and hyperinsulinemia is much more common and more and more scientific studies are pointing to the fact that due to hyperinsulinemia all these metabolic disorders which i told you are the root cause so in fact this is this could be a unifying theory of chronic disease so but problem is in mainstream medicine we all take these conditions one by one and we give medicines separately for each of them for you know if you go to a doctor if you have high blood pressure you will get some couple of medicine if you have diabetes you get another three medicines if you have heart disease you will get a few more so what is happening is you land up we treat all this as a separate separate diseases and land up taking you know a, a bunch full of medication without seeing the elephant in the room that is insulin resistance so once you realize this then only there is hope that we can you know work towards correcting these disorders so that mainstream medicine has to realize and for in certain uh, conditions we do realize but still we do not for example in polycystic ovarian syndrome it is a known fact that it is due to hyperinsulinemia and we have known this since the 1980s but all we do is give met- metformin and then some other drugs only without addressing the nutrition which is the most important thing so what happens is we just give a pill for every ill i say and then we give more pills so the pills what they do they manage to control the parameters for some time but actually the disease is getting worse for example in diabetes 
you you start with uh, two pills and then four and then in to maintain the same blood level your your number of pills are going up and then insulin so actually your disease is getting worse the, despite of the fact that your blood sugar levels remain the same so it has it has been shown in many randomized control studies that even if you tightly control the blood sugar levels the end organ damage at the end of you know a decade or two decades remains the same so it is diabetes is actually not a disease of the sugar it is a disease of insulin that we have to realize and deal with accordingly so the this approach is not working so hyperinsulinemia is the real culprit in fact scientific studies point to the fact that process of if you want to heal yourself the process of healing of virtually every major disease from cancer to diabetes to heart disease has at its core the same basic approach that optimize your diet to improve your insulin sensitivity and bring down the insulin resistance in fact your variability in life span is regulated by insulin but why do we not hear about this so much maybe because it is not profitable because here your health is in your own hands it is in the in what you eat you have to regulate your diet to reduce your insulin levels medications are not the main do not play the main role here medications can help you only in an emergency but not you know to prevent these metabolic diseases so do you, are you insulin resistant just answer these questions to yourself that uh, do you constantly crave for sugary or starchy food <clears throat> do you have fat around your belly do you measure your you know waist in inches and uh, divided by your height if it is less than 0.5 you are okay if, are, if it is anything more than 0.5 that means there is excess of fat in your belly have you been frustrated by failed attempts to lose weight with a low fat diet do you have high blood pressure or high blood sugar do you have high triglycerides do you have fatty liver you must uh, uh, you can know this by ultrasound do you have patches of colored skin you know dark patches around the neck and uh, the axilla known as acanthosis nigricans do you have gout gout is also due to hyperinsulinemia by the way do you have a family member with uh, insulin resistance known insulin resistance or type 2 dm or do you have a family member who have had gestational diabetes or polycystic ovarian syndrome now if you have answered yes to one or more of these questions it is very much possible that you also have hyperinsulinemia why has it been so often undiagnosed you know we often we think of insulin only when uh, we think of diabetes that is what the mainstream thinking has been and our medicine is to be given you know which is a drug for diabetes but insulin as i said is a master hormone it plays a role in each and every cell of the body so we have ignored the the role of insulin or hyperinsulinemia in the entire picture of all the diseases and also because blood glucose has been easier to measure so our view of diabetes has become a glucose centric view and uh, but as i told you insulin resistance is may not be always hyperglycemic state like what happens uh, suppose you are when you are young at 20 years of age your sugar is normal but since nobody measures your insulin your insulin may be sky high so this may continue for for years for decades together even at the age of 30 your sugar is normal but your insulin may be very very high if only we knew that we would have done something about it but at the age of 45 or 50 what happens is your the sugar levels also come up that is when uh, classically you are detected as a diabetic and then insanely enough we give more insulin to treat a condition where insulin is already high so that is what is gone is completely wrong in the treatment of diabetes so that's only one example and instead of uh, uh, realizing that diabetes is a nutritional disorder can only be treated with correction of nutrition we try to treat it with medications that is not the answer so 
a word about uh, the relationship of insulin resistance to the pandemic you all must have heard and known by now that uh, uh, it is the comorbidities which has which reduce your immunity and makes you more vulnerable to covid-19 virus and um, I, i will just give you one example for example uh, obesity was described as one of the independent uh, comorbidities independent risk factors for a vicious cytokine storm in covid-19 so do you know why it is not because of uh, you know people couldn't understand why a 21 year old who is otherwise healthy and a little bit obese had a vicious cytokine storm the receptor through which the covid-19 virus enters the lungs the ace 2 receptor ace 2 receptor is 10 times more in the fat cell so what happens once this virus gets into a fat cell the inflammatory response is very very vicious so that is how this you know uh, metabolic disorder is what you know causes the suffering or the or the severity of covid-19 so i would say that uh, the real pandemic much more than the covid-19 is that of these deranged metabolic health which 90% of the population are suffering from a much b- bigger number than covid-19 people suffered from the huge pandemic is that of impaired impaired immunity the virus just was riding on it well if you uh, all of you must have heard of louis pasteur he is the one who propagated uh, the germ theory on which the entire modern medicine rests he said uh, you know on his deathbed he realized his mistake he said that it is the germ theory is not correct he says it's not it is not the germ it is the terrain which matters terrain means your body your immunity which makes the difference so is there any hope yes i would say you know that it is possible to be healthy and you know prevent all these lifestyle diseases how actually your body is designed to be healthy over a period of millions of years you are equipped with powerful healing mechanisms that will self correct most health problems if you provided with the ideal condition all you need to do you know what is standing in the way we ourselves we have to get out of the way we with our you know wrong information that we get we with our uh, uh, beliefs at times we with our prejudices we must realize that as a species we are uh, programmed genetically to eat a particular type of food and a different food that we get. as i said we have a paleolithic body and we are giving it a space age food that becomes the issue so how to start what is the way to optimum health start by understanding that medicines pills pills medicine is not health care medicine is sick care you should need it only when you become sick food is health care and that is the beginning of your understanding so how to remain free of diseases metabolic diseases eat real food these three words you must remember real food means whatever comes in nature and you you know like ancient man or like any other creature you go and get your food even if it's from the market it should be what is there in nature and you must bring it home cook it and eat nothing that is ready made and out of anything ready made and you know out of packets is is bound to be processed and that can lead to insulin resistance so how you insulin resistance can be reversed you know if you eat real food insulin resistance can be reversed and it can be reversed quickly if you do it in time so whenever you eat something keep this in mind whenever you eat something ask yourself that what i am eating is it going to shoot up my insulin is it going to shoot up my sugar so that itself that thinking itself will prevent you most of the time so what do i mean by real food something what you are seeing in the picture and this will help you to attain metabolic flexibility what is metabolic flexibility it is the ability of your body to use you know you have a healthy metabolism and use some amount of good carbohydrates which you can see in the green leafy vegetables and also to use healthy fats these are healthy fats 
you know butter cheese um, uh, and the fat which comes with meat and fish so that is a very very healthy fuel for your body and also some amount of carbohydrate so if your insulin levels are high your body will not be able to use fat as a fuel it will get stuck in the glucose burning mode it will store the fat glucose extra glucose as a fat and you will remain metabolically unhealthy so you will be metabolically inflexible so metabolically be flexible you have to eat real food eat real food is the answer something like this and another very very important uh, thing you must remember that stop using vegetable oils firstly these oils which are marketed as heart healthy and vegetable oils there are nothing vegetable about this vegetable oil these are edible seed extracts it started from you know early part of the last century uh, you know cotton seed oils uh, which were marketed in america uh, crisco if i am not mistaken dave and uh, and it has come to our country um, in the 70s you know safolas the canolas you know sunflower safola these are these are highly processed if you look at a, a, a vegetable oil factory it resembles a petrol refinery because you know they undergo a same kind of process they are heated to 1200 degrees centigrade they are then you know uh, deodorized they are the, the discolored and uh, chemicals are added at every stage and then a golden color is added and then marketed as heart healthy so by that time it has become highly inflammatory so these are never these were never meant to be eaten by us and by eating this the, the scientific there are reports a lot of papers are showing that they are directly inflammatory they cause heart disease they cause cancer and many many other uh, 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 metabolic disorders so i'm not showing the papers if anybody is interested i will i can share but that is a fact that uh, vegetable oils are very very and it it is just poison so what what do you use as cooking you you use traditional medium in our country we have always you know thousands of years we have used coconut oil we have used some ghee which is very very healthy and it is i know uh, they have very high temperatures uh, boiling points and they are very very stable at high temperatures these are not and uh, so those are the traditional cooking and some cold pressed seed oils which were traditional so that is what should be used as a cooking media not these poisons very obvious if you look at uh, uh, these pictures this is what you should not eat the bread the noodles the white rice and the starchy uh, vegetables which grow underground there is nothing but sugar and uh, nothing this uh, part of the picture is self explanatory these are highly uh, not only raise the sugar uh, but they raise the insulin hyperinsulinemia which causes all sort of problems and if you do that on a non stop basis day after day many times a day you are bound to land up with uh, metabolic disorders um <clears throat> no alcohol either uh, i'm sorry but <laughs> you may not like this but uh, some of the alcohols are nothing but pure liquid processed carbohydrates like beer uh, the problem with alcohol is that it is a direct liver poison and the liver recognizes it as such and whenever you eat uh, alcohol along with food uh, the liver will metabolize the alcohol first and the, and the and will hold the metabolism of the other food products so that uh, delays the entire digestion um, some would advocate a little bit of red wine once in a while that's okay once in a while but uh, other than that alcohol is uh, not uh, not very conducive to metabolic flexibility so you must the most what most people do is that uh, they look for shortcuts and uh, a mainstream medicine is also geared to cater to the shortcuts you know where there is a demand there is a supply so you know quick pills to you know, to so you say no, i'll have some this so i will take some medicines to bring down my blood sugar uh, let me eat all this so but uh, 
lifestyle change requires a lot of effort and uh, uh, so that has very few takers but there are no no shortcuts let me share my own story uh, uh, about uh, 10 12 years back i was also uh, i had um, few metabolic issues quite a few i would say i was obese i was pre diabetic i had hypertension i had joint pains and uh, you know instead of uh, uh, but instead of uh, you know going to the mainstream way i thought uh, let me do a little bit of research and that is when i stumbled across this entire um, research of uh, insulin and its role and metabolism so i, I took a path which was less taken i would say and this is how i am today you can see me and in this this take a lot of effort it didn't happen in one day but yes it is possible to do it and these are some of my benefits i lost nearly 30 kg uh, uh, i used to have bronchial asthma which is gone i had become pre diabetic which got normalized no more hypertension my knee joints pains are gone i used to have hyperacidity and grd which have disappeared appeared um, uh, my waist size has come down to 32 inches which i am maintaining for the last 10 years and more than that uh, my energy levels are much better i do not suffer from any midday fatigue despite of working um, long days you know uh, and and freedom from food this is a part of the fasting regime that i do um, i had my meal last meal nearly 24 hours back um, i don't feel hungry so basically what i'm trying to tell you is it is when you address your insulin you address your metabolism and once your metabolism normalizes everything else falls into place that has been my realization so your weight loss is a secondary benefit your normalization of blood sugar secondary benefit what has actually normalized is your cell metabolism because eating in a way to reduce your insulin goes down to every cell goes down even deeper goes down to your mitochondria that is why you feel so energetic when you are fasting because it affects the entire body entire cell so this is a hugely emerging science which is very very fascinating and it works so my realization is that we have not evolved to grow old and become progressively sick as we age our bodies are actually fantastic healing machines and we have the potential to stay healthy as long as we are alive basically we all have a life span we all have a life span and we also have a health span and ideally our life span and health span should be the same and we are capable of that we should not spend the last decades of our life suffering eating you know pills and pills and pills or becoming you know sick and becoming bedridden and other serious condition no that is not how we are built that is not our potential our potential is just the reverse there are communities um, uh, where we, this has been observed that people have people can be healthy till the day they are alive and that is how that is what the goal of medicine should be so once again i am going to leave you with this message today on world health day that it is this elephant in the room it is this insulin resistance which is the cause of all these number one killers of the population today so that has to be kept in mind and you can you know do your own research talk with your doctor if you need more information i am there to help you and you should work towards your own health going for pills is not going to help you to become well so uh this is a disclaimer at the end of the thing so please do not change any medication you'll stick to me take this information and work with your doctor if you need more information i am there my assurance is that whatever i have told you today every sentence is backed by evidence which has been published so that assurance you can take from me and work with your doctor to towards your health and that is my my wish and my hope to reach as many people as possible as many medical professional as possible because each doctor can influence a lot of patients lot of lot of people
so this is what i am trying to do spread this message and uh, i wish you very good health on world health day and these are my social media handle this is not the end of the conversation let's say that this is the beginning i am ready to answer your queries questions now or if you want you later you can contact me i have a facebook group with this name are you as healthy as can be you can join there and uh, let us continue this conversation let us continue to be healthy and thank you very much for a very patient listening thank you so much sir it's a very insightful uh, uh, you know uh, webinar as well and i request all the participants to please uh, if you have any queries or if you have any opinion regarding it you may put forward please yeah. do so thank you tarik <clears throat> Uh, hi doctor uh, my name is uh, samudra uh, actually i have one yeah. question that uh, regarding fasting uh, yeah. i have observed that uh, like uh, whenever i fast at the end of the fast i am doing a 24 hour fast or a 16 hour fast at the end of the fast i feel very uh, energized so okay. uh, is is that very normal because there is a, i notice a slump of my energy and then at the end of the fast i see that i, I feel as if i can run Uh, I don't know whether, uh, but is that very normal or uh, yes. what is the <clears throat> way yeah? What is the of fasting one should do in a week? Yeah, it actually. Uh, uh, let me answer your first question. It is normal because uh, when when you learn how to fast and uh, go into it in a scientific manner, you just can't jump into fasting. Whenever somebody is learning how to fast. i say go slow because your body is you know used to eating multiple times a day so one must go very very slow so once your body gets adapted to fasting then what happens is your body after a certain period of time say after 20 or 22 hours um, you are using instead of glucose which has been depleted by then ketones which are breakdown of fatty acids from your from your own body fat as a fuel so that using fat as a fuel gives you more energy and it has also been seen that your noradrenaline levels go up so that also gives you makes you feel more energetic so that is why you feel uh, you know more energetic after a particular period of time but that has to be done scientifically and uh, recently it has been shown that when you uh, exercise exercise or even do marathon running on a fasted state Uh, you perform athletes perform much better this is uh, as contrary to the previous understanding that you must carb load yourself before doing marathons not so your body fat um, uh, which breaks down into ketones gives you a much better fuel i hope that answers your question it is normal to feel more energetic uh, well look at me <laughs> yes any other question ever since i have uh, benefited from this uh, i have also tried to help people there i told you my story today but there are dozens of stories uh, which are on a personal level who have uh, benefited from this kind of lifestyle uh, by controlling the insulin by intermittent fasting and um, they have managed to not only to lose a lot of weight but they have managed to reverse their metabolic conditions and let me tell you let me that it works it works all the time and it brings about a wonderful change um, uh, in the lifestyle uh, sometimes um, uh, it is a, a problematic issue because we are used to a particular way of eating and um, Uh, then and then eating um, a lot of uh, uh, protein and fat which is needed maybe expensive affair maybe at times so people ask me then uh, how to how do you uh, 
how do you watch for that how do you calculate i said you have to calculate the cost of uh, becoming sick later on and spending um, so much of money on medications and treatment rather than eating well so invest today in your health it's like a health insurance you know eating well eating real food because junk food is cheap and it is becoming cheaper by the day and that is by deliberate plan mind you it is it is i always say that the plan to keep the population sick is a very big one it pays it pays to the companies which manufacture cheap uh, junk food you know they make it very tasty so you get addicted to it but if you eat real food and you will naturally be eating less number of times in a day you don't need to our our grandparents themselves they used to eat two i have seen my grandmother eating just one meal a day so i am not surprised by it so uh, if you eat real food you will not only eat good eat real healthy things protein and fat which mm. is needed by your body and that will keep you energized and healthy and at a, at a age like you know when you are 40 plus or 50 plus when you need much more protein and then before uh, much more uh, healthy fat this is the time when uh, people eat less so that is very very sad anyone uh, has any insight any remarks i may dr das uh yeah was like i'm 50 can you hear me yeah i can all right good i was diagnosed huh. with diabetes in the 90s yeah. in 2019 okay. as your chart predicted i contracted bladder cancer um and um, went through all, yeah. all of that it it made perfect sense in in retrospect with looking at your diagram of uh hyperinsulinemia and its yeah, effect. Right. and since yes. that time up until february i just kind of ate what I wanted to eat. And then an endocrinologist said, you need to be on another one of your medicines, not yours, but another medicine to make my blood sugars look better because they were quite high. And adopting the approach that you've advocated around February 24th, I went to back to my, I had done fasting before. In fact, I fasted before each chemo treatment, which is a whole new okay. line of research. It's yeah, an extended, yes, yes. extended fast of over 42 hours prior to each chemo treatment. And I suffered right. zero chemo side effects that, that I could, it's, they gave me four different kinds of medicine to use if I was nauseous. I never used a single PRN, prorenata pill to oh, treat man. nausea. Now they gave me Audensitron uh, as part of the chemo, but I had no problems. So there's an example where, where a extended fasting really activates your body. Uh, the healthy cells learn to adapt to the fasting state. The cancer cells yes. have no way of dealing with it. And, and they, they become yes. more susceptible to the chemotherapy. But what I wanted to say is that since February 24th, I said, I don't want to be on this medicine. I don't want to be on, I won't say it because I don't want to bias. I want to do intermittent fasting 24 and lower lower my carbohydrate intake which initially my goal was less than 100 grams per day and now my goal is less than 40 and as you say it could be zero so and i've lowered my blood sugars over the last couple of weeks into what would be considered the normal range at half the dose of metformin so i just That's wanted cool. to and i wanted to i wanted to testify i wanted to offer a testimonial as to how this works and how quickly it works, even in the face of less of this medicine that, that wasn't controlling my blood sugars at twice the dose. Now, I would probably get an A1C in the range of less than six, which is desirable. That's all I wanted to share. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. It's been it's a, what a wonderful uh, testimony to whatever we have been discussing today. And uh, for the rest of you, if you don't know, Dave is a, is a medical researcher at a very prestigious university in USA. So, um, uh, absolutely wonderful, Dave. So, and, and, and actually talking about cancer, it's a very big, very, people are realizing now that 
what uh, um, uh, you know that this hyperinsulinemia and high blood sugar plays a very big role in in uh, the causation and the number of studies which have shown that it uh, helps in chemotherapy and helps with radiotherapy is is growing by the day so simply because uh, uh, the cancer cells they love sugar and if you deprive them they tend to you know subside and keep quiet for some time thank you again dave it's been a wonderful uh, wonderful talking doctor, to you doctor i yes. had one question hello yes uh, doctor i had one question uh, like since uh, since i have started uh, fasting and everything since i have started fasting i have noted once for carbohydrates has gone later eat a little bit of carb i feel like Uh-huh. like there is a glucose crash like i feel as if i'm like yeah. down to sleep and like it, is it like uh, uh, earlier also it was the same but now i feel like as if my body is responding more to that yeah uh, possible so the, yeah like in the <laughs> afternoon Hello? suppose i can't, yeah i suppose in the afternoon i cannot even have a, like i will avoid rice because mm-hmm. it makes me go on a slump so is it normal or is does it happen this kind of things i should be avoid yeah. the, the carbs at lunch those kind yeah yeah you, actually you will find that uh, if you are uh, if you continue with a carbohydrate diet you will find fasting a bit tougher so whenever somebody um, when you want to prolong the duration of fasting i always say that eat more proteins and fat in the previous meal then that is more satiating and because that is more satiating you will feel less craving for hunger and even to break your fast suppose you have fasted for 24 or 30 hours and you feel great i have done a great job so let me have some ice cream no that is going to take away your entire good effort because the moment you take carbohydrates especially processed carbohydrate when you break your fast that is once again going to shoot up your sugar and insulin so the entire benefit would be gone you will again feel very hungry and you will crave so the best thing to break your fast with <clears throat> is something uh, you know uh, which is a combination of protein and fast i am i usually break my fast with a bone broth or something like that and then go in for a you know other food when i eat whatever i eat protein and fat so that uh, uh, will even more satiate you even more and you will find that you will eat as much as your body needs and not more and these carbohydrates they have a way of fooling your brain like when you when you when you eat fat and uh, if you can do an experiment if i give you a, a, a bottle of ghee or a chunk of butter how much can you eat you can eat two three teaspoonful after that you have, you will stop right because why because there is a feedback loop in our body and there is a feedback loop to some extent for the protein and the fat and protein combination which comes in nature you know in nature fat and protein is a combination which is available carbohydrates never there you have to get it separately so uh, since we don't need them so what happens is when you uh, eat carbohydrates you stop only when you are physically full so that by the time you have taken in too much of it so that is why you can never get the benefit of fasting so fasting is a very powerful tool it is a hormonal intervention and uh, uh, there are studies which are published in very good journals like NEGM also which which says that it is therapeutic in nature and should be taught in every medical school and every practitioner so how to use the fasting as a as powerful tool to heal diseases you can have a full day on fasting so talking about fasting <clears throat> uh any other question thank you uh, thank you sanna as you know uh, recently i had uh-huh. a kidney transplant and i was uh-huh. not a diabetic but my there is family okay. history of uh, diabetes of three of my siblings <clears throat> okay but when i was started on say steroids like uh, vizolam 20 ng per day and then tacrolimus was very high 
so around okay. 5.5 mg twice and uh, so i had a shoot of with in the sugar it became around say uh, 400 500 like that and i was given insulin and then uh, they did it uh, say for uh, 10 days then they stopped and they started with say gliptins and uh, um, say uh, the long acting cyclotrogs so then it came down but still it was a bit high around say 250 to 60 like that then i stopped carbohydrate and i took to protein and uh, fat so right. now i have restricted the carbohydrate very much and almost uh, i'm not taking a little bit of uh, rice with chapati and that's the carbohydrate yeah. only and some of the other carbohydrate diets totally i have stopped so now it has come down to around uh, uh, 200 205 sometimes 180 like that but with uh, also the drugs so i just want okay. to stop these drugs and just continue as soon as this steroid is uh, tapered down within next three months to 5 mg and tacrolimus has come down to 1 mg bd now it will become say 0.5 okay. say, after some days then i will probably have a uh, low sugar but still what should i do now that's what with the drugs uh, continued yeah so um, so if you are on medications and your sugar levels uh, are coming down due to a low carb diet you must first of all keep a very close watch you know uh, uh, do a blood sugar uh, once or even twice a day if necessary yes, and re reduce the medication by 25 percent at a time you know say every every week or every few days till you find that you don't need them anymore so a very very uh, you know uh, a statement from a bariatric surgeon i will quote he said that you cannot have type 2 diabetes if you do not take carbohydrates so it's as simple as that so if you if you are gradually able to reduce your carbohydrate you will find that uh, your medication levels are going down one thing i would like you to keep in mind is because you got the steroids, maybe your sugar levels shot up. So that is another factor. Cortisol and sugar uh, sugar are very much related. So if you are not on steroids and if you are doing a low-carb diet, your medications requirement is bound to go down. So keep a check and then gradually reduce your... Uh, um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I, I just want to confirm... Uh, what is your name? I just missed you. Uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, Sorry, just tell me your name. This is Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I, uh, you, you are a doctor yourself, so you can monitor. And um, and uh, if you need any more information on this, let me know. It is possible. And. Um, Many people believe that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, not taking carbohydrates is harmful, or eating a lot of protein is harmful to the kidneys. These are also been not been verified by uh, recent studies. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Dr. Das, I had a question re referring yeah. to the previous, I think you said doctor's uh, question about yeah, their yeah, trans yeah. transitioning to lower carbohydrates. Are, are continuous yeah. glucose monitors available or uh, are in common use? Uh, they are available, but they're not in common use. Okay. It is a bit expensive. The liver, the hyper hyperglycemic liver L I B R E that is available. Libra, yeah. Uh, Libra is available in Amazon India, and uh, but um, not many endocrinologists. Uh, uh, you know, I think Roshni does it, um, but um, not many endocrinologists use it on a regular basis. But um, it's a wonderful. It's a game changer. I would say. Uh, even if you wear it for 15 days, you can make out what trend of how your sugar is behaving with what kind of food. So then accordingly, you can make your own chart. I just think it would yes. be helpful, especially when you're making that delicate transition off of possibly yeah. off of insulin 
and where yes. it's very important to have a constant yes. reading of your yes. blood sugar as opposed to one or two times a day. Yes. That might be a device that you could just use as a transition until you're off the insulin, where it's not so, not so vital that you keep uh, from hypoglycemia. That's that was my absolute. That's, yeah. That's a very good input, Jay. Very good. Tarit, please uh, consider about this. A continuous glucose monitor. Yes, sir, Sam CGM. Yeah. You are doing yes, it? I'm yeah. Doing it. That's excellent. So that will help you to monitor continuously, you know, when you are transitioning. Yes. So even, even if you don't do it for a long time, that when transition period, it is going to help a lot. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I think this has been a wonderful um, discussion and um, um, let's hope we have more of this uh, and uh, there are so many things to talk about. Uh, and, um, yes, Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. It was, it was an amazing session with you. It's more to Thank come. You. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank As I said, uh, uh, let, this, let this be just the beginning. And uh, I hope to interact with all of you again and again. And special thanks to David for joining in. I'm so happy to see you. I hope I can interact with you more. Wonderful listening to you. Wonderful. Yes, Wonderful, yes. everybody. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you. Enlightening yeah. season. And yeah. we could uh, you. know many things from you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think this is just the beginning. Yes. Uh, so here we conclude the session. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the participants for joining. Thank you, Dr. David, for joining. It was an amazing <laughs> session with you. Amazing to hear you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you and good night from here. Good night. Good night. Yes. <laughs>